Shabbat Shalom. Yas Shalom. Yas Shabbat Shalom to everybody, whether we are near or whether we are far. And we send greetings out to all our brothers. And it's good to come together on these Shabbat, you know, so we can really fellowship and we can um, hear the word and read the word and absorb the word so that we can be better equipped for the days that are coming up. Um, the things are um, going to be pretty perilous for some, but those who have obedience to um, our, our Father in Heaven, we should be secure in what we're doing. And so keep um, reaching out to other brothers and sisters so they can understand who they are and how they fit into the scriptures that we've all been uh, raised on. Most of all of us on the conference call has been um, in the Holy Bible, um, and some have been in the Quran. And um, so, but we are familiar with that. See where we are located in, in the Bible. See what is in store for us, who our ancestors are, and how we fit in. Okay? Keep inviting those um, that are associates of yours, if they're brothers and sisters and family members, and most of them are going to say no, um, but some will listen and some will read, and some, a few, will research, and those will, will find, and those who seek will find. That's what is promised in the scriptures. So, with saying that, let's get into this lesson. The, the topic for tonight is Queen Esther. Queen Esther and Purim. It might could be called also, we got to throw Mordecai in there, because he's a very important character in, in, in what we're going to cover tonight um, in preparing for an upcoming uh, festival or feast called Purim. And I remember I heard this about, oh, two years ago, Shammai Wan did a class on Purim um, in 2017. And I think that was the last time we really covered it. And it's good to go over it so that way you brothers and sisters can understand what's involved. So that, because I heard it when first said Purim is coming up, I'm like, Purim, I've heard of Passover, i heard of the Feast of Tabernacles, i heard of the Feast of Trumpets, i heard of Pass, you know, uh, Day of Atonement. But what's, what's going on with this Purim? So it's an often look, overlooked book in the scriptures called Esther. And that's where we will find out about Purim. And then we want to go over that in, in detail tonight um, so you can have a good understanding. So if you brothers and sisters already are familiar with Purim and what it's all about, that's a great thing. For those of you all that are not, then this can be very informative what we're going to share tonight. And some may have heard about it, but not really the full story. So we're going to give you the full story tonight, and we're going to be reading mostly from the book of Esther. So you can locate that. Um, it's located in uh, right before the book of Job, which is right before Psalms. So that's near the middle of the Bible. So it's, um, it's the book of Esther, then you have Job, and then you have Psalms. So we're going to be in Esther um, tonight and reading a lot of scriptures from that. So um, with that, let's... Um, Get into some scripture, um, and like we always do, let's start at Colossians. Let's go to Colossians and set this table um, at Lion's Roar. We're going to go to Colossians three seventeen. Colossians three seventeen. So, if you brothers and sisters, you like I said, we're going to be in the King James Bible um, tonight, and we're going to also be in the Apocrypha just for a brief moment. So Colossians 3.17, it reads, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all by Hashem, Hamashiach, Yehoshah, giving thanks to our power and the Abinawa by Him. So everything going to the Father, Abinawa, has to go through Yehoshah. Yehoshah, for those that may be new on the line, that is the uh, pronunciation of what most Christians and most people associate with Jesus, okay, and it's in the Bible as Jesus, but we substitute the Hebrew name of Yahweh and Abba is for Father, and Power, or Most High, we'll use those interchangeably, okay? So we're not 
in a different Bible than you're in. So if you're following along, we're in the same Kings, James. We just use the Hebrew words whenever possible. All right. Now let's go to Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three, and we're going to read verses. 15 through 17. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. And they read, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in the Mashiach, that's Christ, Yahweh Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of the Most High, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of the Most High may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that's what we do, as you know. And most who know about um, Israelites who are waking up and know who they are, we know that we rely upon the Scriptures. And we teach from the scriptures. We don't do a lot of fancy talk and a lot of hooping and hollering and, and breathing loud and, and asking for tithes and offerings and kicking up the choir. We just get to the meat. We get to the scriptures and we go over that. Because so that's what we're going to find understanding and instruction for righteousness that we just brought out. So before we get into the, to the foundation of today's lesson, this, um, when you hear about Purim, that word is, is like, well, I know for myself, when I first heard it, I said, whoa, what is that? Is that some type of holiday? It, it doesn't sound like it should be something that we should be observing. And it is not in Leviticus 23. As we know about Leviticus 23, that's where all the high holy days are pronounced, and they were told by the Most High to Moses to give to the children of Israel. You will find in Leviticus chapter 23, it starts off by talking about the Shabbat, of the Sabbath, and why it's important that we keep that, and how to keep it. And then it goes into Passover, it goes into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it goes into all the high holy days, that, and, and, and it ends at the Festival of Tabernacles. Okay, so it goes over all of those. And some Israel, uh, awakened Israel, only deal with those. However, those were given, and those are truly high holy days, and we all observe those high holy days as we were commanded to. But there were other um, days that were set that were had to do with our captivity after Moses. So after Moses gave that out in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Scriptures, then we had disobedience, and then which led us into captivity, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Medes, and the Persians. The, the Greeks, and also the Romans. So when we roll into those captivities, there were certain events that were heroic, if you want to use that word, that caused Israel to pronounce a day that they will remember those days. One of them is the Feast of Dedication, who we know Yahweh, our Christ, observed that day. It was brought out in John. He observed that day. That's not in Leviticus 23, but it was it, it, dealing with the Maccabees, and it was significant enough that Yahweh, our Savior, actually observed that. And here's another one we want to get into, and it's also uh, Nicanor, uh, Nicanor. That's another one that's brought out in the Maccabees. I'll talk about that a little later very briefly. But we're going to get into Purim, and we want to see that it wasn't a high holy day, but we're going to see why that uh, encouraged that we actually observe this day. And as we mark off our calendars, like we went over last Shabbat um, with uh, Shema 1, he brought out and, and we were going over the calendar for the upcoming holidays, or the holy days, right? We were going over those, so that way you brothers and sisters can note them down, and it would be it's smart, or wise of you, as I will choose to do, is to, if you have an employer, if you're not self-employed, they kind of, when you know what the dates are, Ask for those days off in advance, because when it when it, it comes right up on it, when it's like a week away, oh man, here comes you know. But the next um, holiday after, uh, excuse me, Shalakia, instead of Holy Day, the next Holy Day that we have coming up is going to be the Passover. 
after Purim is over. So we need to know when that is, so preparing and putting the days off so we can properly rest. Because most of the high holy days, you have, they're called Shabbat, which means they are rest. They're not the sixth day Shabbat that comes every, like we are right now. That's going to come every seventh day, right? But those other ones are days of rest, and they're sometimes called Sabbath, because Sabbath means rest. So ask for those days off. That way you can now participate in some of the things that we were directed to, commanded to, um, observe. So let's get into it. I just want to give you that little uh, up front of how we're going to cover this. And we're going to go to the book of, of Esther. Now can all your brothers and sisters hear me okay? I'm not muzzled or... Yeah, I can hear you. The water sisters. And it's so good to um, get all the sisters on here. I think this is a good, good topic for you sisters. <laughs> because I remember one of the sisters told me a couple of years ago, man, uh, all the thing y'all talk about is all dealing with you brothers, you ox. I mean, you know, we, we, in, we know some stories in the Bible about sisters. So um, that way we, not that they just want to be proud to see sisters in there. That wasn't um, how we received it. It's just that they want to know how they can better conduct themselves in a spiritual way provided from information from the Bible. So that's what we're going to see today. This is going to be a good one for that. So I'm, I'm so happy and pleased to see um, sisters that's on the line and quite a few of you. So um, this is going to be a treat. So um, let's get into it. Let's go into our foundation of scripture, which is going to be Esther chapter 9. We're going to go to chapter 9 and set the foundation, and we're going to build upon that foundation. But we're going to go to Esther chapter 9, verse 20 through 24. All right? Again, Esther is toward the middle of the Bible, right before Job, and right after Nehemiah and Ezra. So I hope you all got it. And we're going to go to chapter 9, verses 20 through 24. And they read, and Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both high and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar, and the 15th day of the same yearly. So right there we see that Mordecai, we're going to talk about him, I'm going to introduce him in these scriptures if you don't know who he is, we're going to get a good introduction to Mordecai in a moment. But um, he wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews. Now this word Jews, just so you know, the word in Hebrew for this translation of Jews that's in here is Yahudi. Yahudi. Alright? And that means anybody that is either from the seed of Judah, which was a fourth son of Jacob, established the tribes of Israel. Jacob established the tribes of Israel, and his fourth son was named Judah. So if you are a descendant or a seed of Judah of those twelve tribes of Judah, you can be considered a Jew. But also that definition, Yehudi, that also can mean someone who is Israel who's in the territory of of what is was known as Judea, right? That was the southern kingdom who was based in Jerusalem. And the tribes that were always along with Judah, you had Benjamin, who else you have? You had Levi, and some sprinkling of, of Simeon, all right? So those brothers, those tribes, when the word Jew or Yehudi is mentioned, that encompasses all of those. So you can be from one of those tribes. I just want to lay that out there so you see it. So here we go back to verse 20. And this and Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Yehudi that were in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, both high and far, or both near and far, to establish this among them that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly. 
So right now, Adar, we are right now currently in the month of Adar. It's just the 12th month. Adar is the 12th month on the Hebrew calendar. The, the new moon or the new month started on the 5th of our Gregorian calendar. So on February 5th, that was the, when, the, when the new moon was there, that established the first day at evening of the 5th. So when you count the 14th day of the 12th month, which is Adar, the 15th day is going to fall on this coming Monday on the Gregorian calendar. Or that's just your basic calendar we have in captivity that you and I all know about, right? And then the following day, which is Tuesday at sunset, that is when the 15th day starts. So those are the two days that Mordecai um, established, and we're going to see the story behind that in a moment that we should observe that yearly. Let's go to verse 22. And the days wherein the Yehudi rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from morning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and of sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. So the question that pops up, well, 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 what are we supposed to do on this day? Okay, well, when we see that this, now that we see the backdrop of the story, right here in verse 22, lets us know how we can celebrate or observe that day and again by feasting and joy so it's not a somber um, 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 holy day or observance it is to be feasting and joy and also sending portions one to one another and gifts to the poor so when you want to give gifts why not do it on Purim when you want to reach out to the poor, and it ain't hard to find poor people, especially in Israel. They always are amongst us. So giving to them, those are the ways we can observe and to participate in Purim. You see? Now let's go to the first part of Esther, and let's see what this story is all about. Again, you brothers and sisters, you Akim, who may already know about this, just um, repetition is a beautiful thing. The more we hear it, uh, they used to go to the temple daily. Uh, so they used to go to the temple every Shabbat, and they would read from the book. Even though they may have heard it before, they read it again. So it's always in you, because a lot of this is going to be pertinent, especially if times start to change and things get really tight when things are going on in the world just like was going in in all our captivity. One thing you can rest assured, in every one of our captivities that Israel has been part of, we had to go through something. So we're in this captivity now. We know about slavery and all the, the oppression and those type of things, but things are going to turn even more. So we have to rely upon these words and see our forefathers and how they responded to that so we can respond accordingly and to never, ever, give up the faith and the trust in our power. Let's go to Esther chapter 1. We're going to read the first three verses first. And set a little marker if you have a marker in Esther, you can use your finger. So we flip out of that and go to another book. We're going to always go back. We're going to spend the majority of the time tonight on this Shabbat in the book of Esther. All right. Esther chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. And it reads, now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, that, that is, Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. So this is his territory, in verse 1. This is introducing us to the Medo Persian rule, right? And Ahasuerus, he was the king and his territory if you're familiar with the maps all the way from India all the way to Ethiopia which is in northern northeastern Africa that's how much territory so Jerusalem is part of that 
however they weren't in Jerusalem at the time when this is writing. And also the time period was right around 521 B.C. All right, 521 B.C. is when this is opening. And the Babylonian Empire had been overthrown. That was when King Nebuchadnezzar and his bunch, they were overthrown by the Medo Persians. And Cyrus was the king who defeated them. And that was done in 539. That was about 18 years prior to Esther, what we're writing here. So 18 years, the power has shifted from Babylonians, and now it has gone over to the Medo Persians. But, and they inherited all of the spoil, which is all of the territories and all of the people their own. All right? We get some more into that in a moment. But it was a, a hundred and twenty seven provinces. So that's a lot of territory. Let's go to verse two. That in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants. The power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces, being before him. So this is what this is how this story is unfolding. You got 18 years after the Medo Persians have taken rulership, and they have inherited all the the, the inhabitants. We're being part of it. Our, our ancestors being part of that. The Yehudi are being part of that. Okay? So, let's go now to verse 9 and 12. And introduce you to the, one of the first, another character. Let's, we talked about the king. Let's talk about his wife. Let's roll over to verse 9 in the same chapter. Chapter 1, verse 9. And we're going to read down to 12. And it reads, And Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Okay? Now, one thing about this king that we just read above is that he's throwing a party. He's throwing a big feast. And the verses that we didn't read, I'll just tell you what it is. He's showing off all his wealth, all the stuff that they have inherited, their glorious kingdom. He's showing it off. And he's having a big feast. He's inviting all the men, all the nobles, the princes, and all the, the ones throughout all the land to come to the palace because it's going to be a seven-day feast that's going to be going on. His wife, the queen, Vashti, she made a feast for the women. Because you know how the women, they don't want to be cut out, right? <laughs> they want to have a little party too. So you got the king in heaven theirs, and so Vashti is calling one with the women at the royal house which belonged to her husband. So that's where they're going to throw their party at. Now let's go to verse 10. Now on the seventh day, that's the last day of their festival, when the heart of the king was merry, in other words, when he was pretty intoxicated, with wine, he commanded Nehuman, Bisca, Harbana, Bigtha, and Abantha, Zetar, and Karkas, the seven chamberlains, that served in the presence of the king, or Ahasuerus, the king, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal, to show the beauty and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look at, or the fair to look upon. So what is going on now? She's got her party going on, but the king, or he's all drunk and everything, you know, men want to boast when they get a little intoxicated. So he, he wants to show off his wife to all the princes who have gathered there at his party. It's the last day of the party. So he wants his wife to come. So he ordered his chamberlains, and I already read those names, and I don't want to read them again. But he, he ordered the chamberlains to go get his wife so he can bring her there so he can show off. Go get the crown royal and put her on, put it on her. Now y'all know the crown royal is, right? Uh, you, if you don't remember, it's this, remember the, the liquor called Crown Royal? It came to look bad yes. back in the day? Yes, we're on the show. Not the rap Not the Not the rap That's right, sister. They, in, that, in that bag, we used to keep all kinds of stuff. Chains, I used to keep marbles. I used to play marbles a lot. I used to have a Crown Royal bag that my dad had. But 
on that crown raw bag was what? It was the image of a crown. So that's what he was ordering her, um, his queen, to be adorned in. And come on out, because she was a beautiful woman. She was fair to look at. Verse 12. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore, the king was the king very wrong, and his anger burned in him. So he pretty much got embarrassed right there on the spot. He's ordered his man. He's supposed to be a king. They want to go get her. And she said, I ain't going with y'all. <laughs> and so when that word got back to the king, of course, he's now embarrassed in front of all his kingdom. <laughs> right? So you know how he was feeling. Now let's jump down to verse 15 through 19. Because this is important. 15 through 19. What shall we do? Verse 15. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law? Because she has not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlain. Okay, so they, these are the chamberlains after she refused. They're saying, what are we supposed to do? She's, according to the law, when it says that, that's not the Hebrew law given uh, by the Most High of Moses to us. That's not that. That's their law, all right? So, and they were supposed to be obedient to the king. So, they weren't following that. Verse 16, And Mimukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti, the queen, has not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes, and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of this deed of the queen, thus shall they arise too much contempt and wrath. So these, these, these chamberlains and everybody said, oh man, this can't, this can't go on. If, if your wife then basically told you, no, we got to do something about this queen. You got to listen to us, king. You can't allow this because it ain't just your reputation of you being angry because all these women, after they hear about what has happened, to you, they want to be treating us the same way, and we ain't had it. Verse 19. So if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. So keep in mind, this is a new kingdom. So they're still writing laws and establishing their kingdom. So that's why they keep saying, let's write a commandment for this, do this, blah, blah, blah. They want to make sure that it's a commandment, a law that's written, and it will be maintained by the person of the means, and it won't be altered. Because we can't have this going on. Back to the scriptures. That Vashti come no more before the king, Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. So right there, they're asking, okay, Let's give a commandment because that type of work, I mean, that type of action, if it was a happening, let's make this commandment now. That if it happens by another queen, we'll get rid of her and the king will get a new queen. And that would be a law. All right? So let's go down to verse 22, the last, the last verse in chapter 1. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces and to every province according to the writings thereof and to every people after their language that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. So they are trying to establish the law that the man is running things, right? And that type of action won't be tolerated that the Queen Vashti did to the king. <clears throat> so that's and so the king approved of that, and so they sent everything out with his signet. With his letterhead, not letterhead, they didn't have letterhead, but his signet is up from his ring is what symbolized that it was from the king and he has authority, so everybody have, everybody have to abide by it. It is now law. 
All right. Now let's go down and and read me some more. Let's go to chapter two and read verses two through four. So we have Esther chapter two, verses two through four, and it says, "Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be a fair young virgin. Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king." And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all fair young virgins unto Shashun, the palace, to the house of the women, and to the custody of Haggai, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women. And let their things for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. So basically, they're about to run a pageant. All right, they're going to go out to all the provinces. They're going to ask what uh, the the most attractive woman, this the most fairest, a young virgin, and they're going to bring them all back to the king's chamberlain, who is in charge of women. This is a guy who is in charge of the women. His name is Haggai. They're going to bring all of the women to them and they are going to have a pageant and whichever one pleases the king that will be the one that's going to replace Vashti because of what she did all right so let's go to verses five through seven and let's meet Mordecai we talked about him opening up let's meet him right now it's uh Esther 2 we're going to go verses five through seven it says now in Shashun, the palace, there was a certain Yehudi, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yahar, similar to my name, the son of Shema, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Aha, uh-huh. that's Mordecai. Even though they call him a Jew, a Yehudi, remember I said, who was the tribe that hung with um, Judah in the southern tribe? Benjamin was one of them. So by him being called a Jew, he's not from the seed of Judah. He is from the seed of who? Benjamin. Which is in the territory of Judah. So just note that. So everybody who say that they are uh, 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 of Judah, they don't necessarily have to be from the seed of Judah like our Messiah, our Hamashiach, was from the seed of Judah. But they could be from Jim from um, Benjamin or Levi. Anyway, we see Mordecai is from Benjamin. Verse 6, who has been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Now, this captivity, may, let's go visit where this captivity came from. Let's go to Second Kings, chapter 24. Because it's all you'll see more clear. We're going to go to Second Kings, chapter 24. That's going to the left in your Bible. Second Kings, chapter 24. We're going to hit verses 10 through 15. So you can see about this back. Because remember I was when I opened up and was in, informing you all that the, the the Babylonian Empire had just ceased. And when it now goes back in this verse 6, was reading it in Esther, when they carried them away captive. Here's that story very briefly. 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 10 through 15, and it reads, verse 10, At that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. Now, who was all in Jerusalem? We already talked about that. The Yehudi, Judah, Benjamin, Levi, and some Simeon sprinkled in. Verse 11, And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiachin, or Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers and the king of Babylon took them in the eighth year of his reign and he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of Yahweh 
and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Most High, as the Most High had said. So when they did this, like people, it's, it's difficult to find any of our treasures, our vessels of gold that Solomon had, because the Babylonians destroyed it all. We see it right here, verse fourteen. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained saved, I mean, except the poorest sort of the people of the land. So we know, Yehudi, we're some very intelligent men of Most High's chosen you would expect nothing else. We had craftsmen, we had smiths, we had all type of trade. Then all those men of valor were removed. And the only thing that was left was all the poor, what they considered worthless. Verse 15, And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and his officers, and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now let's go back to Esther, chapter 2, verse 6. So now you see how they were, Mordecai and his family were in Shashun, in that Babylonian um, territory that is now the possession of the Meadow Persian. Alright? Verse number 7. I'm back at Esther, chapter 2, verse 7. And we talk about Mordecai. And he thought of Hadassah. Hadassah. That is Esther. So that's her name in Hebrew. Was Hadassah. His uncle's daughter. So that means Mordecai and Hadassah, known as Esther, they would be what? They would be first cousins. Right? That's his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful. Whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took her for his own daughter. All right? That's what, now when you say he bought up, or when the scriptures say he bought up Hadassah, let's look and see what that means, because his his uncle's name was Abihel. That was his, his. That was his father's brother, and their daughter was Hadassah, known as Esther. Right now, let's see. When it says he bought her up, what does that mean? In order to find out what does that mean, let's go to Ephesians chapter six, verse four. This is important. Ephesians chapter six. Verse 4. Okay. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And it reads, I'll wait for you to get there. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of Yahweh, of the Most High. So that's when, when he says Mordecai brought her up, that means he nurtured her in the admonition of the Most High. So that means the laws, statutes, covenants, all of that he raised up Hadassah, known as Esther, to observe. So she was brought up very well. Now let's go back to Esther. So when you say he popped up, so when you see when people raise people, just like people now, when they step in and raise their someone who may be incarcerated, someone may have passed away, and they take on, a lot of grandmamas get this woe, where they got to raise their grandkids, you know, because of something that's happened to their parents. That are whether a brother or sister have to step in and raise those kids. But know this that when we talk about Mordecai and the way we should raise up individuals, whether they are kids or those that we step to the plate and raise, we need to raise them in the same manner as Mordecai did. 
that was brought out in Ephesians in the ways of the Most High. We got to teach them the commandments. Teach them how to act. That's better than any home training. Home training is the next best thing, but this is better than home training. All right, let's get back to the scriptures and go to verse number nine. We have second Salakia. We have Esther chapter two, verses nine through eleven. And the maiden pleased him. The maiden pleased who? The maiden pleased the 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 chamberlain, because when they bought the fair maid. So she was the one that was chosen uh, from the providence that Mordecai was in uh, because of her, be her beauty and her fairness and her being a virgin. So back in verse 9, And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her things for purification with such things as belonging to her and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. So right there, your Israelite sister, you know she's bad. You know she's beautiful. You know she carries herself well. And it ain't all this funny stuff that we see going on today. Showing cleavage, showing this, certain stuff. No, she's got class. Because why? She was brought up in the ways of the Most High. So she is a beautiful sister. And most people now realize, and I know I'm realizing now, most beautiful women of the world are these beautiful black Israelites. Back to the scripture, verse 10. Esther had not shown her people nor her kindred. For Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. That just simply means Mordecai say, hey, keep it on a down low that you are Yehudi. Don't tell which, which kindred you come from. Just keep it on a down low. You ain't lying, you just ain't saying. Verse 11, And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the woman's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. As her, he act like a father, right? That's a true father. That's a true brother. Even though that's his first cousin, he's obviously older than her, that he can pass her off as being his daughter. And that's how he's accepted her. But that's his first cousin. But he's treating her. And not only is, when she's been chosen to go to Shashun to the palace, he wants, because remember, he stays outside the gate. He always comes by the gate. And you want to see about that more as you read the story. But he was right there on point, watching out and seeing how she failed. That's a true brother. All right, let's go to um, Psalms chapter 106. As we read how she was getting all kind of kindness and showed um, a lot of pity. Let's see why. Let's go to Psalms 106 chapter 106 Verse 46. Oh, this is real close. So I'm going to start putting the pedal to the metal just so we can make sure we get to the meat of the story. It's a good story. I may not be a good storyteller. I'm not trying to be. I'm just working. This is a good story on its own. 106. This is Psalms 106, verse 46. A simple scripture, but check it out. Psalms 106, verse 46. He, who is a he? The most high. He made them also to be pity of all those carry them captives. And we see that today. That's the way, man, God was so good to us. He really is. Because even though we go through captivity like she went through, He has made it. The Most High has made it to be pity or to obtain extreme kindness from even the captors. Now look at us today, even though we've been through all this slavery, even though we've been to the captivity here, because our forefathers heirs, heirs of ours, he said, well, we still look, who, who's top selling artists? Who's an athlete? You look singers, beautiful women. I mean, you just name it, guys in our form and our physiques. I mean, and people notice that. The other nations notice that. They want to call it, we say something about it, they want to say we're racist. But the Bible is saying this all along. He's going to pity 
all of those carry them captives. All right, let's get back to Esther. Let's go to Esther chapter 2, verse 15 through 20. And it reads, in verse 15, Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, that was her father, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, so you see she's also of the tribe of Benjamin, right? Because Mordecai's father and his father's brother, they were both Benjamin, right? And so that makes um, Esther, I like her other name better, Hadassah was um, also a Benjaminite, was come to go into the king. I'm back to reading now. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor, and we just talked about that, in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken into the king Ahasuerus and to his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibet, uh, Tibet in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. You see how that worked out? Let's keep on reading. Let's get down to verse 19. Verse 19. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. So he always hang around the king's gate. Verse 20. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people. So she hasn't revealed who her heritage is. Back to scripture. And Mordecai had charged her, as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was bought up with him. So she's, she, see that bought up is a lot of what she's going through and how she's expressing herself. Now let's go to, to uh, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16 and see how, <laughs> how this relates. I thought about this and it just sounds like, like this, this fits. Matthew chapter 20 verse 16 Matthew 20 and 16 reads so the last shall be first and the first last for many be called but few are chosen and I just thought that was ironic and that's how the most high treats us we should never forget that we should never forget that even though we know our history even though we know where we come from whether we know our forefathers in Egypt Babylon, Assyrians, all the way to American captivity, which is the last captivity. We got to rely upon these words that, hey, he still looks after us, right? The first, the last will be first. So even though we're treated and we're trapped on and we're saying, well, we're your chosen, why are we like this? Look at the story that we're going over right now, and out of all those virgins, out of 170 some provinces, our 27 provinces, they chose our sister. Most high made that happen. Let's go back to Esther chapter 2. I got to speed it up here a little bit. Esther chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. <laughs> this is a good turning point right here. Esther chapter 2, 21 and 23. In those days, while Mordecai sat at the king's gate, Two of the king's chamberlain, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wrong, and sought to lay hands on the king of hazards. So you got Mordecai hanging around the gate, but these gatekeepers, these two chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, they were mad. Who know that why he was mad? He was probably mad because their daughter or somebody from their province wasn't chosen and you got um, Hadassah, who has now became queen. So they mad, they wrong, right? And they wanted to lay hands. Lay hands ain't just meaning going and, and throwing a couple blows. That means they wanted to kill the king. Verse 22, And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen. And Esther certified 
the king thereof in Mordecai's name. All right, so this is Queen Esther. And when the inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged. Who were the two that was hanged? Not Mordecai and Esther. It was those two who was plotting to kill. There were chamberlains that was uh, wanting to lay hands on the king. So those two were both hanged on a tree. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. You see that? Now these, when it says in the book of the Chronicles before the king, that's not a Hebrew book. All right? But you see a lot in the, when we read the scriptures, say, and that also was written in the book of, of, of the kings or the battles or the wars or jubilees or so forth. This is the, their book, the chronicles that the king, the king takes tabs of in his kingdom. Everything that happens in his kingdom is recorded. So this event was recorded into those chronicles. All right? Now let's go meet Haman or Haman. Haman, Haman, whichever one you pronounce it, I'm not a great pun, a, a man of pronunciation, but I'm going to call him Haman. Haman. Let's go to Esther chapter 3, and let's read verses 1 through 10. All right. Here we go. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamidia, Hamitha, the Agag Agagite. Now, Agagite, I did some research on that. I'm going to pause it real quick to let you know who Agagite is from. Guess which nation he's from, Agagite. He's from the nation of our arch rival is who? Esau. How do I know that? Because Esau had a son who was named Eliphaz. Eliphaz was Esau's son, and he had a son named Amalek. Remember Amalek? And remember when, when King Saul was told to go kill all of them and he didn't? That was Agag. That was the son of Amalek. And then that same somebody, this is all told it in Samuel, the end of 1 Samuel and the beginning of 2 Samuel, you'll find this story. We ain't going to go over it now, but if you want to make a note, go back and read it. It's a good story. And, and that was the same branch. So they are, and his name, uh, Agag, means violent. So, and they are all descendants of Esau. All descendants of Esau. Back to the scriptures. We back in, in Esther chapter 3. And we left off on Agagite. And advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So you got Haman after those two guys got killed. I got Hom that we just read about. Then Haman got promoted. This is the one that's Agai, right? From the scene of Esau. Verse 2. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate, they bowed and they reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai, he bowed not, nor did he give a reference, a reverence. All right, so it was a command after he promoted him. He was like the right hand man. When y'all see him coming, everybody's supposed to bow and give him reverence. Verse, but Mordecai did in verse 3. And the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? So in other words, Mordecai, why you ain't bowing down, man? Why you breaking this commandment? You know it's the commandment of the king. Verse 4. Now it came to pass when they spoke daily unto him, and he listened not unto them, he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Yehudi. Verse 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. So here's this guy who on his high horse, like a lot of people's bosses, want you to give him some type of reverence and stuff like that and bow down to him. He don't have to be physically bound down, but you know what I'm talking about. A lot of people have an arrogance about him. But Mordecai was standing his ground saying, hey, I'm a Yehudi. I'm a Jew. You know, uh, I'm from Benjamin. We don't, we, don't, we don't get down like that. Verse 6. And he felt scorn to lay hands on Mordecai, so he now wanted to kill Mordecai. This is Haman. 
for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Yehudi that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. So now he is mad and he has set his heart to actually go out and want to kill Mordecai, and not just Mordecai, but all of the Yehudi, that were all our ancestors who are throughout that whole land from India all the way to Ethiopia. That's called mass genocide. That's what his plans were. Verse 8. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. Talking about all laws that was given by the Most High to Moses to Israel. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer or to allow them. That's what Haman is telling the king. Verse 9. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business. So no other is going to be in charge of getting this mass extermination of God's people. I'm going to pay them 10,000 talents to bring it into the king's treasuries. Verse 10. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamathatha, the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. Isn't that, ain't that true? Jacob's enemy is always how to be Esau, right? Now, here it is again. In Esther. Alright. Now let's go, when we leave off this, but some people say, well man, why didn't Mordecai just go ahead and bow down? Why did he go ahead and do that, man? Let's take a look at what. That's one thing is a devout. Let's go to the Apocrypha. And let's go to the, the continuation of Esther. Go to the Apocrypha Esther. And we're going to read from there because what Esther leaves off in the Bible, it starts back up in the Apocrypha. Now I'm going to read Esther chapter 13. This is in the Apocrypha. It's going to give you another piece of the puzzle. Not a puzzle, it's just going to give you a piece of why Mordecai acted the way he did. And now I've got all of Yehudi, all of God's chosen, in jeopardy. <laughs> Here we go. Esther chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. If you don't have an apocrypha, just listen in. This is Esther in the Apocrypha, chapter 13, 8 through 14. And it reads, Then Mordecai thought upon all the works of the Most High and made his prayer unto him, saying, O Yahweh, Yahweh, the King Almighty, for the whole world is in thy power. And if thou hast appointed to save Israel, there is no man that can gainsay thee. For thou hast made heaven and earth and all the wondrous things under the heaven. Thou art the most high of all things. And there is no man that can resist thee, which are the most high. Thou knowest all things, and, and thou knowest my power, that it, it, it was neither in contempt nor in pride, nor for any desire or glory that I did not bow down to proud Haman. It's called Haman here, but it's Haman, the same guy. I'll read that again. Thou knowest all things, and thou knowest my power, that it was neither in contempt nor in pride, nor for any desire of glory that I did not bow down to proud Haman. Or Haman. For I could have been content with good will for the salvation of Israel to kiss the soles of his feet. But I did this 
that I might not prefer the glory of man above the glory of my power. Neither will I worship any but you, O power, or O hot most high. Neither will I do it in pride. That's sincerity. That's Mordecai breaking it down, saying, I didn't, I didn't do that for no glory of my own. I'm trying to be hard here, trying to stand, you know, none had to do, it had to do with you. Because I know you're the creator of all things, and now Israel is in jeopardy. But I know you, power, and I don't do that in pride. So that was his prayer, and that's a sincere prayer. Because Mordecai, even though they were looking at it the wrong way, he knew that he couldn't bow down. Why did he know he couldn't bow down? Let's go see right quick. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5 and 6. So you can put the Apocrypha away. That's the only verse you're going to hit in the Apocrypha. And we're going to um, hit these remaining scriptures. Let's go to Exodus 20, 5 and 6. It should be very familiar to everybody. This is where we find the Ten Commandments. We're going to read verse 5 and 6 of chapter 20 of the book of Exodus in the Torah. 5 and 6 says this, Thou shalt not bow down. You see that? Mordecai know that. We know it too, don't we? Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, thy power, am a jealous power. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Who hated him in this case? Still got Esau, Haman. So it's going to revisit it. Verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. And do what? And keep my commandments. That's why I take commandments. Let's go to Acts. Keep your finger in, 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 in Esther. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. 20 through 24. I think that's what I want. Yep, Acts chapter 16, verses 20 through 24. <laughs> it reads, And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Yehudi, or being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. This is what the Romans say. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude ro rose up together against them, against the Yehudi. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Verse 24, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. In other words, they bound their feet in those wooden stocks or chains. This is how they treat us, and even still down to the day, they still treat us the same way. But that's a whole other subject. But what I want to bring out here is in all our captivity, this is a Roman captivity. We're not talking about it. They treat it so, is it going to come again? Because now we're waking up and we get back to those commandments and all of a sudden it's causing friction because we ain't getting down like our ancestors in America used to get down. We standing for the laws, statutes, and commandments. So be prepared as we awaken that these things happen but have the the, the the strength of Mordecai that he showed that example that's why these stories are so important that's why Purim should be observed so we can understand so we can prepare our minds and our hearts for something that may be on the horizon let's get back to it let's get back to Esther chapter 4 Verse 3 and 4. Esther chapter 4. Verse 3.
3 and 4. And it says, And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning and sadness, sorrow among the Yehudi, and fasting and weeping and wailing, and made many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent Raymond to clothe Mordecai, and to take away his sackcloth from him. But he received it not. He received it not. Because now, all these letters are saturating throughout all the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, from India to Ethiopia. And now when, when they read this, almost reading, this is going to be your death day. Can you imagine getting a letter from the U.S. government <laughs> saying, hey, this, on this day, y'all getting killed. That you know what to write on your tombstone. You know it's put on the bird. But you, can you see the mourning and the wailing and the weeping and how they, when you lower yourself in sackcloth and ashes, that's extreme humbleness to the most high. Nothing, that's a humble state. Ashes, what is, well, nothing. Even soil has a purpose. It can still grow stuff. But when you burn stuff to ashes, that's the low. So when our people clothe themselves in sackcloth and get into ashes, that's a, a mourning state. And that's what Mordecai. And so when, when the queen heard about this, she sent him to have some clothes on, put some clothes on, but he refused it. Now let's go to Psalms chapter 77, verse 1, 2, 3, to see why Mordecai refused those, those clothes. Psalm 77. Psalm 77, verses 1, 2, 3, 1 through 3. Or 1, 2, 3 is the same as well. Psalm 77, 1 through 3. I cried unto the Most High with my voice. Even unto the Most High with my voice. And he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought Yahweh. My soul, my soul ran in the night. And cease not. My soul refused to be comforted. That's what Mordecai was going to do. His soul refused to be comforted. Verse 3. I remembered the Most High. And was troubled. I complained. And my spirit was overwhelmed. Salah. So that's what Mordecai was going through. That's why he was refusing to get those things. Let's go back to Esther chapter 4. Verses 7 through 17. I'm going to just read this because we, i got to get these last five scriptures in after this. And it's a lot of reading. <clears throat> but stay with me because it's a, it's a good story. We should get through on time. <clears throat> Esther chapter 4, verses 7 through 17. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened to him and of the sum of money matter of fact, Mordecai right now is talking to one of the uh, the gatekeepers, right? And Mordecai told him, verse 7, of all that had happened to him and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasury for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shashun, uh, Shashun to destroy them, to show it uh, to Esther and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go unto the king to make supplication to, to, unto him, and to make request before him for her people. So Mordecai is using this guy, this, this gatekeeper, to take a note telling the queen to go in and, and ask and even plead and give supplications, pretty much beg the king on behalf of her people. Verse 9, and the messenger, that's her top, came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. 
Again, Esther spoke unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whatsoever were the man or woman shall come into the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the king for these 30 days. So Esther responds back to the message Mordecai sent. She's saying, go tell Mordecai that, hey, I just can't go. He's my husband. I'm the queen, but I just can't approach him. The reason why I can't, because he has to actually call me before I can come into his presence. Because it's a law that if I break that law, if I approach him when I don't tell him to come, the, 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 the punishment is death. Verse 12. And they told, so they went back and told Mordecai Esther's word. Verse 12. Verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself, that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thou peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So he is now responding back to her, Say, you got to listen to me. I know you didn't get the queen of you. You just get a little afraid in there, but you got to listen because if you don't do this, your life ain't going to be spared neither. So don't get it twisted. Verse 15. Then Esther, being uh, brought up in the way of Yahweh, verse 15, then Esther bade them to return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shashan and fast you for me and neither eat nor drink for three days night or day I also and my maidens will fast likewise and so will I go unto the king which is not according to the law and if I perish I perish so Mordecai went away and did according to all that Ezra commanded him. so she got encouraged by Mordecai after he sent that word to her and she were because she was brought up right and she just said, Okay, I see what you're saying. So if if they go if I'm on Paris, if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. But I'm gonna go to him. But please, Pat, please fast and pray for me. Because we all in my house, these seven maids that I got appointed to me, we all gonna be fasting and praying too. Let's get it. Let's go to uh, the next chapter, verses one through four chapter 5, 1 through 4. And it reads, Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house, over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen <laughs> standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. Remember she was a beautiful lady. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the, the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is your request? It shall be even given thee to have of the kingdom. It's beautiful. And Esther answered, If it seems good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. So we see right there, the king accepted her to come in. Once he saw her, that beautiful Yehudi, that beautiful Israelite, sat there, he poured out the scepter, so that way that means come on to me. So what do you want? So she told him, I want a banquet, and I want to invite Haman to this banquet. Let's go see something real quick. Let's go to um, Proverbs 21 and 1. Proverbs 21 and 1. And see what just happened. Proverbs 21 and 1. I'm going to read it real quick because i got to keep going. Proverbs 21 and 1. The king's heart 
is in the hand of the Most High. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. That's what just happened, Akim. Go back to Esther. The king's heart is in the Most High's hand like water. He turns it wherever he wants it to go. So he was, he was make. you'll see the rest of the story. Let's get to it. Let's go back to Esther chapter 5. Let's read 9 through 14. And it says, Then when Haman, then went Haman forth that day. So now Haman coming to this bank where they prepared, right? Verse 9. Then went Haman forth that day joyfully and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up, nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. So here is Haman coming back to the king's palace, and who's at the gate? <laughs> it's always Mordecai. Does Mordecai get up and do any, and bow down to him? Nope. And so what happens? Mordecai is fired up and full of indignation. Verse 10. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends, and Jerish, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches, and the multitude of his children, and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, and how he advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. So basically he was at home bragging. He got all his family talking about his wealth and his new promotion, and just like some people do in the world today. Verse 12, Haman said, moreover, Yet yeah, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. So he's telling his family, everybody, bragging with all his partners, saying, hey, I'm going there. The queen invited me. It's only going to be me, her, and the king. Look at me. I'm Mr. Big Shot. <laughs> Remember the most high, what he going to do with the king's heart? With the waters? Verse 13. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the, at the king's gate. Then said Jerish, his wife, and all his friends unto him, let the gallows be made of fifty cubits high. And tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet, and this thing please Haman, and cause the gallows to be built. So Haman and his cronies, they're building gallows uh, fifty cubits high. Just as so you know how high fifty cubits is, that's seventy three feet. That's about six stories six stories and he want to hang Mordecai on those six story gallows I'm not going to go back to Matthew because uh, I won't have time I'm just going to read Esther chapter 6 and chapter 7 because I got to get this done we may go over about 5 minutes Akim, but please bear with me this is a, we're about to, I'm just going to read 6 and 7 together here we go on the night, on that night, could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles. Remember, we talked about that before. Remember what was written in those book of chronicles, right? And they were read before the king. So this is the most high that we just read how he moves the king's heart. So he couldn't sleep. It was something, and so he had to go and, and just read the chronicles. Verse 2. And it was found written that Mordecai, that Mordecai had told of Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on the king of Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor and dignity has been done to Mordecai for this? Come on, this guy saved my life. I'm reading the Chronicles. This guy saved my life. Is there any honor or dignity been done to Mordecai? Back to the scriptures. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, there has nothing been done for him. Verse 4. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was coming to the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come on in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto this man? whom the king delighted to honor. Now Haman thought in his heart, 
To whom would the king delight to do honor more than myself? Arrogant. Edomite. Verse 7. And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighted to honor. Let the royal apparel be bought which the king used to wear, and the horse that the king rides on, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal whom the king delighted to honor. So they're going to put him in all his honorable apparel, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. Verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste, and take the apparel and the horse, and thou, as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew. <laughs> so you can just imagine Haman's face. Right? He thought it was going to be for him, right? <laughs> and the honor and, and, and that is all made for Mordecai the Yehudi that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Verse 11. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai. You can imagine how he must feel right now. Having to do all this after what he feels in his heart. Verse 11. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the street of the city and proclaimed before him. Thus said it be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house, mourning and having his head covered. So he, that which was uh, first is last. He's humbled now. Verse 13. And Haman told his wife Jerish and all of his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise man and Jerish his wife. This is what they said to him. If Mordecai, check out this what he said to him. If Mordecai be of the seed of Yehudi, of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. So they know the reputation of God's chosen people and when you mess with them, right? So you ain't going to succeed. That should be encouraging to us. Verse 14, And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains, and hastened to bring Amon into the banquet that Esther had prepared. See, he still don't know the queen is a Yehudi. Here we go, verse uh, chapter 7. So the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther the queen, and the king said again to Esther on the second day of the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted to thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed, even to half the kingdom. Then, as so he basically said, I'll do anything up to half the kingdom. As you know, in the settlements, they get half. So, so verse, verse 3. And Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, yeah. let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. Now she's revealing who she is. Verse 4, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondsmen and bondswomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king answered and said to Esther, the queen, who is he? And where is he that does presume in his heart to do this or to do so? And Esther said, The adversary, the enemy, is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and queen. So now Haman is hearing this for the first time that she's Jehud, Yehudi, and the king is hearing it, but he's still, that's his, that's his queen, and he's still giving her anything, and he wanted to know. Who's going to kill you and your people? What, just show me where he is. And all of a sudden, you can just imagine the sweat, just a sweat just pouring off this guy's head. Hey, after she, she said, that's him right there. Verse 7, and the king, verse 7, and the king arising from the banquet of wine and his wrath went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen. Now he begging. Now he's going to, 
Oh, please don't get it. So here we go. For he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace gardens into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed. All right? Whereupon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in his house? So the king walked in, and now Haman on the bed begging her. So, you know, that set the king off. As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows, fifty cubits high, that's six stories high, where Haman had made for Mordecai, who spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. On that one, I won't, I was going to read parts of eight, but due to the time and due to Purim, read what happens in eight. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you instead of reading it, because what happens next, uh, Esther goes into the king and says, okay, that's done. Haman is, and his wickedness is done. And you see how the Most High turns everything around. So, but what about my people? There's still a decree on the 14th of the 12th month that they going to get killed. And so what happened, the Mordecai is given the king, I mean the ring, they took it off the, the dead hung Haman's hand. The king's ring, they took it off they put it onto uh, Mordecai, and Mordecai was in charge of the kingdom now. But kind of like Joseph and Pharaoh was. Remember the story of our people? It always happens this way in captivity. That's why we should be strong, knowing it's going to be all right in this captivity. Put these examples here. Anyway, Haman, Shalakia, Mordecai, he put the ring on. He sent the decree to all the Yehudi, to all the kingdom, that... The king has now said, all the ones who are plotting to kill you all from the original decree, you all now have a commandment to kill all of them. So on that 13th day of Adar, which is the 12th month, that's when our, the, the Yehudi started to kill all the enemy who were set up off of Haman's charge to kill all of the Yehudi, all the Jews. So after they fought, and in, 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 in chapter 9, it tells you the amount of people, it was 500. In, in chapter 9, verse 6, it says in Shushan, that's what the palace is, remember? In Shushan, the, the Yehudi, the Jews, slew and destroyed 500 men. Now skip over to the, the verse number 16, because that was just in Shushan. So they, they, they killed... 500 men who were, who were plotting to kill the Jews in Shashon. Now in verse 16 it is where it says, but the other Jews that were in the king's provinces, remember all the provinces from India to Ethiopia? They gathered together and they slew their enemies 75,000. 75,000 people were slain. They were preparing to slaughter and get the, the, those silver prize, the, 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 the bounty to kill the Jews. All of them were, not all of them was dead. So after they did that, they rested. That's what verse 17 says. And on the 13th day of this month of Adar, that's, and on the 14th day of the same, they rested. And they made it a day of feasting and gladness because they had overcome their enemies when they were first sorrowful, now they were joyful. So now, to close it out, going back to where we started, to uh, verse 20 through 24, now you should have a full understanding of what happened. 20 24 says that Mordecai wrote, I mean, just to let you know, I'm in Esther chapter 9, verses 20 through 24 again. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews that were in all the providences of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, 
to establish this among them that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Dar and the 15th day of the same yearly as the days where the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy now you understand that I, I, you have to read it you see how it was from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor in verse 24 because Haman the son of Hamatha the Agagite the enemy of all the Jews had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pure that is the lot to consume them and to destroy them so Akim the Akim for going over about 10 minutes but that's the story of, of Queen Esther Purim um, and, and I hope you see some relevancy in, in that story that we can grab onto because we're still in captivity and things can still switch on us but in saying that I'm not going to keep talking I'm going to say shalom and anybody got any comments, questions or anything the mic is yours Hey, so I just got to say something real quick out there. Uh, this morning, one, uh, in comparison to today's times, uh, when you were going over Chapter 2 with the Chamberlains, yeah. I was thinking about, uh, for some reason, my mind went to the basketball player, Will Chamberlain. And uh, <laughs> there was a movie that he played in called Conan the Destroyer where Arnold Schwarzenegger, I don't know if you brothers and sisters remember that movie, I do. Uh, but yeah, he says he played a uh, he played an actual Chamberlain in that movie. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny his last name is Chamberlain. They probably actually chose him to play that role as a Chamberlain, a large man protecting a uh, uh, a woman. You know, and uh, it was a, it was a version, and uh, yeah, that was a big part of that movie. And then uh, another thing I wanted to say is, um, number two, is when you look at the Elamites, which were the Persians, uh, they were the East Indians today. A lot of them East Indians still have that custom when it comes to choosing a wife. They have a huge banquet, and they have about 50 women. They come up and they actually, I, I know because the, my neighbor was an East Indian, and that's the way his parents, the, the traditional way of getting married their parents put together a banquet and they bring women over and these young men interview about 50 different women before they choose their uh, wife. So it just shows you that that custom hasn't changed from the East Indians from the past. They're still doing the same thing, the same custom. You know, this just shows the validity of uh, the customs. There's one more thing I have to say, but I can't remember what it was, but... Uh, that's cool. I, I just wanted to bring that up. I didn't have too much. It was a good class, Art. Good class. Way to, way to link those scriptures up, too. All right. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, man. Yeah, good. Good Shabbat Shalom. I know you're out of Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. He's trying to remember that last thing. <laughs> she might have been tired. <laughs> you did say that um, Agar, was that the name? Agar is C of Esau? Is that the name you used? Yeah, of um, Agag. H-G-A-G. Okay, A G. Um, okay, A G A G. No, A G A G. Oh, A D A D. No. A G. H. Like O G. Mm -hmm. A G. And then oh, it said right. A G A G. I got. It. And yeah. if you go back, you can read about that in, in, in First Samuel, and also the last chapter in First Samuel. And then the first chapter of 2 Samuel, that's when uh, they came to David 
after Saul fell on his sword, but it didn't kill him. And so this anger, uh, and so he was, if Saul would have done what the Most High told him to do, which is wipe them all out, mm -hmm. by him not doing it, that same one he supposed to have killed came back and took his life. Oh, yeah, I think I, yeah, I read that recently. Okay. And he was an ag guy. Yeah. And they're descendants of Esau. If you go back and see the, the linkage, Esau, Eliphaz, Amalek, and Agag. So that's the, you know, but it's A-G-A-G. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the church is spirit today. And you said that um, Purim, that's a good time to give gifts to the poor. Did I hear you say that? I mean, I, I, I used to, but now I'm just like, they're doing it. It's a reason. 
You know what I mean? Anytime mm-hmm. people go around hating on people like that, it, it's, it's, you have a major hate for us. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it normally means that you're jealous. Of course. The, the, the salt of the earth. You know, the salt of the earth. So, that's why they do Because we got so much feelings. You know? That's right. Yep. And, and they don't... Let me see something like Christmas support. Uh, let me see if anybody else for because I know I went over the time. If they had any questions about the uh, about Purim or anything before, then we can get back into uh, these current events. Anybody got anything? I, I do. I, I, this is Brother Eric. I do have one small question. As far as the timeline of the Babylonian captivity and the Medo-Persia captivity. I really don't have those timelines down in my notes as far as knowing exactly when that started and when each one started and when each one ended. But I am thinking of uh, the three Hebrew boys. That's in the beginning. That's in the Babylonian captivity. That's before this? Or is that after this? Son, that, that was before this. If you got a picture, I'll give it to you real quick. But that was talking about the three that were thrown into the furnace. Um, yeah. Daniel? Yeah. Actually, yeah. actually, yeah, that was, um, you see, the Babylon is not, in, is, is not in, in chronological order. Um, and because Esther that we just read is actually before Daniel. So it can confuse and make us think that, okay, this happened before that. But actually, the Babylonian Empire, that's when it happened with Daniel. That started in 607 B.C. In 607. All right. Okay. And it was overthrown yeah. in 539 by the what we were talking about now, the Medes and the Persians. Okay. The Persians. So that was in 539. And see, like we picked up the story of Esther. All of we was reading, it started in 521, which was 18 yeah. years after the Medes and Persians took over, and it ended. The end of the story that we just read when. It was at 509, 509 B.C. So Babylon Empire was first, and then the Middle Persian Empire, and then the Greeks overthrew them in 331, 331 B.C. So now notice, you, you, you know the numbers are going down because it's going toward uh, yeah, the first, the exactly. first year. Exactly. So Babylonian Empire was 607, that's when it started. Babylon, the Middle Persians started in 539, the Greeks started in 331, and Rome, of course, started in 63, right before Yahweh Shah came on the scene. Um, I have a question. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Sorry. Question, I, I, I wait. Um, I have a question. Yes. Yes, you did, but you said that that Babylonian captive, that's where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though I know that's not the, the Hebrew names, but the Hebrew boy, that's in the Babylonian captivity. Con, con. That was a Nebuchadnezzar. That's way, that's way before this. But, yep. But Mordecai, so he, so Mordecai knew of them, and that's another reason why he did not reverence or bow down to that king, because he knew, you know, he knew the law. Good point. Uh, good point. That's absolutely correct. Because almost in all the activities, we have someone who stands up in Israel that that carries them so can support us even now to this class captivity under the Anglo-American and that we're under now. So yeah, the, I I would share that same thought that Mordecai found strength because he knows of the story and that's why they responded back. Remember, uh, Jairus, uh, Haman's wife. And then say, oh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a Jew. Yeah, everything, if you're going to do that to him, everything going to turn out wrong. You ain't going to prevail. Because they probably knew of that story as well. Because kingdoms that, that were in power, and they always fell by the Most High through his chosen people. And they all know it. So I think Mordecai had to know of that as well. Because they were taking, remember, he was taken in captivity. From Babylon, from that's the Babylonians took them from Jerusalem all the way to the to to Persia or to Babylon, mm-hmm. and then the Medes took over. 
So Mordecai was an old guy. Had to be. See what I'm saying? He, he experienced both kingdoms. Because it was only 18 years after they got the story of Esther was 18 years new for the Middle Persian. So he saw the Babylonian Empire, so he knew of Nebuchadnezzar and those King Cyrus and Dar well, Darius is, is a son of the king that's spoken about in in, in, um, in Esther, Ahasuerus. That's his son was Darius. Anyway, you see what I'm saying? Huh? Ah, God, thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Now, what say, sister? You had a question, sister? Do you have a question, sister? Sorry, I didn't turn off the mute. <laughs> um, so, sorry, just, as, just as the brother mentioned, like with the timelines, I'm also having that issue, too, as I, um, as I read through, like, the, I don't know what they call the Old Testament. I couldn't, like, some of the stories, it's like, I thought he died, like, <laughs> you know, like, couple of books ago and then now he's alive again and then like I got confused with the time periods so uh, do you have any suggested reading or something that you could recommend that would help me with the timelines I have a, a bible here you, just, you can find some that gives the um, it, before each one of the books like the one I have is in Hebrew and it's also it's called the uh, the Hebrew English Old Testament. So it goes over the whole, um, and it's from the publishing, who wrote this? Um, Baxter, B A G S T E R. Oh, wait. Baxter? Mm hmm. Okay. And in it, and you can find other Bibles this way as well, before every one of the books, it'll give you the time frame when it was written. When it was uh, when those events occurred, that's when you can see how out of chronolog chronological order the whole Bible is. It is. <laughs> it is really out of chronological order. Now the uh -huh. Torah is in order. I mean, from Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Uh, but then once you pass Samuel, then you got Nebuchadnezzar, you got Ezra, you got, and then you start, and then Daniel. Being in yeah. the Babylonian, you know, then that's the wait a minute, didn't that happen? And it's confusing. But this Bible, confusing. you get other ones. You mm -hmm. can see when it was when it was written. And okay. So that's what I would suggest. Not necessarily this one, but this is a good one. Mm -hmm. But you can find any one when you're looking at them that, that gives you uh, the time frame. Okay. And okay, thank you. That was yeah. helpful. Uh, yeah, some, Bi some Bibles have the timeline in the Bible, depending on what type of Bible you get to, as far as King James. You, you can't find them, you know, because some of them have the timeline. Okay. Uh, is this Zanika, Ebony, or Elisa? It's Zanika. <laughs> Zanika, okay, gotcha. You get all the names, huh? <laughs> 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 yeah, so it's like it's hard to tell, so it's good hearing you, sister. This is the word of the Lord of hosts. I took you from the pastures and from following the sheep to be prince over my people as well. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have destroyed all the enemies in your path. I will make you a great name among the great ones of the earth. I will assign a place for my people in Israel. There I will plant them and they shall dwell in their own land. Thank <laughs> you.